Back to basics. I felt the need to simplify and try out a new style. Now, since these will be wallless, the grid can be one inch. And while the loss of the ability to use clip-on features does at first seem like a major downside, I've actually never used anything but at the table. So this nice compact set is gonna give me that new experience. This is a piece of wainscoting, or wainscoting, you hear it pronounced both ways, sometimes also called beadboard. You can buy it in four by eight sheets from like Lowe's or Home Depot or whatever your big box home improvement supplier is in your part of the world. But really you can use any sort of several millimeter thick hardboard or even wood or even cardboard. I'm just using this because it was left over from a project that I did years ago on the old house. At some point I took the leftovers of that project and chopped them up into all these six by six and two by six and two by two pieces, which I assume I did for this exact project. I don't know. This was like four years ago. But I found this box of cut up scraps during the move a few months ago, and now it's time to use them. The other key ingredient is foam board, and I'm using dollar store foam board. But if you don't have that in your part of the world, any kind of foam board will work. You just might have to soak it in order to get the paper off. Now you see that refrain written a lot when people post about, oh, I can't get the paper off the foam board. Here it is actually in action. Again, it's not necessary with this product, so it comes off pretty quickly, but you just submerge the foam board. If it's a brand with good glue, unlike this, you might have to let it sit for, I don't know, five minutes, 10 minutes, but eventually it should soften up and dissolve and then you peel the paper off. And there's still some fibers left down here you can see, but just rub at them and they sort of like curl up and just whisk away. So anyway, I've got these pieces cut to size and then I glue them onto the pieces of wainscoting. I use white PVA glue, Elmer's. Don't even need to use a brush. It's a good amount and then spread it with the finger, making sure to get all the way out to the edges. That's gonna be the most fragile area. You can do this quickly with the pad of your finger. Now, let me interject here because I realized as I was recording this narration that there was a much, much more efficient way to do this. Simply take your substrate, whatever it is, and cut a piece of foam that's a little bigger than it. Glue them together, and you actually can use hot glue. I, I should have used hot glue because it, it worked perfectly fine here. I was worried about melting or there being a tiny gap due to the thickness of the glue, but there really isn't. So the hot glue, that in and of itself, would have saved 95% of the time. But then I just went to the hot wire table and cut it using the substrate as the jig. And then you get a laser perfect clean edge, which is also hardened and cured by the heat of the wire, helping with durability. Yeah, so the tile construction up to this point took me like, I don't know, two to three hours. If I had done it this way, it would have been 10 minutes. Anyway, the classicest of classic tricks, balled up aluminum foil, roll it around to texturize the foam, make it look like stone. I lightly score out a one inch grid with a mechanical pencil. And now it's time to carve in the stone pattern. Any sort of heated tool will work. I'm gonna use my soldering iron set to a lower temperature and just start going at it. Now, if you haven't done this sort of thing before, which I hadn't, you'll want to make some dummy practice pieces that you don't care if you mess up. And the main tip I would offer you here, the main insight that I had to get that look that you see on a lot of those official branded tiles is don't just cleave through random brick patterns, round their corners. So subdivide up the square with your cobblestones, or if you're not using a grid, just do all your cobblestones, but then revisit every single one, trace around them and let the heat of that tool round to the corners of all of these. That for me proved to be the difference in the final result. For durability, an initial coat of pure Mod Podge, but tinted with a little bit of black paint just so I can see where I've been since the foam is white. Here's the whole set. This is the next day they've dried completely. They don't even have full coverage. I don't care. Doesn't matter. In fact, it'll only add to the grayish chaos that we need later on. And now it was time to figure out the paint scheme. I did a lot of experiments and it came down to these two. I could do each square as its own color and this will help with visibility and gameplay and determining distances. It also just has its own nice aesthetic ring. Or Every individual stone could have its own color. This subtly hides the grid, which is kind of nice, but it's also very chaotic. I don't want these to be very contrasty and very chaotic. I want the features I set on it and the miniatures I set on it to really pop out, not the floor. So I sat on this for two months. I didn't do anything. I put a poll up on my YouTube channel. A few people were leaning the way that I already was, which is that an entire square should be the same color but the vast majority, as well as my wife's opinion, was to go with the individual stone colors. So that's what I did. And we'll get going on that in eight seconds. 
And remember that our sponsor is Heroes Horde for you 3D printers out there. Excellent selection, including all True Tiles lines. Begin with an overbrush of dark gray. An overbrush is not a dry brush. It's where you load up the paint on the brush, then work a good amount of it back off onto some palette, some cardboard, whatever. Point is, it's not a full base coat. You want to be able to strike over the piece somewhat rapidly and get a good amount of paint deposited on the tops of the stones with none going into the cracks. Then I took a lighter gray, this is my favorite gray of all time, slate gray, and pick out one or two stones per square. And here they are so far, looking very contrasty, which I said I didn't want, but don't worry, we're going to fix that. From those two experiments earlier, I also learned that I need a mid-tone, I need a third color. So I mixed these, one part light gray to two parts dark gray. At least for this brand of paint and these colors, that light gray is very overpowering. So to get a color that's truly in the middle, that, that's the ratio that I found. Two parts dark, one part light. And again, one to two stones per square. And here they are looking honestly pretty awesome. It was at this point that I was starting to rethink if I really wanted to go any further at all. Because they really have a like a cell shaded sort of look. But yeah, we'll keep going. Now on those experiments I did earlier, you saw some brown stones. That's this territorial beige color. But as I said, they were too contrasty. They popped out too much. So I'm going to mix this with that middle gray mix I already had. I'm just gonna put some of this in and get a very muted tan color. And I mean very muted. And these, I also did them fairly sparse. So I imagine a, a two by two square area, right? A 10 foot game space. I tried to do two of these tan stones, maybe three per uh, 10 foot area. Lastly, with those base colors all bone dry, and that's key, they have to be dry, move on to a dry brush. This is sandstone, any sort of light khaki or tan will work. And again, if you're new to all this whole thing, this is a dry brush, so it's like the overbrush I said earlier, but we're working off even more paint. So there's, you dip the brush in the paint, but then work all of it back off onto your palette, and then lightly strike very quickly, and the bristles just catch all of that micro detail. Here's one side by side, dry brushed and not yet dry brushed. And once it's dry brushed, it's kind of like frosted up, right? It kind of obscures a bit of that great contrast we had. But I know that my final step is a wash and I, I know what I'm doing here. So just keep in mind, you can do your dry brushing at the end if you want a more contrasty sort of popped result, but that's not what I want. So I did the dry brush here and the last step will be a wash. Roughly 10 parts water to one part paint. And don't bother with flow improvers. You don't need dish soap. You don't need matte medium. You just need some paint and water. Keep it real simple. In fact, I don't want this wash to flow a lot. I want some of it to settle on the sides and the tops of all the stones. I want to tamp all of that result down. I've got four colors at play, plus the dry brush over top. This is gonna help just harmonize everything, dull it a little bit and make it look like a, a grayish dungeon floor that's not boring total gray, but also not super contrasty, like I talked about before. So again, tap water and black paint. Test it out. You can see the consistency I'm playing with here. And remember that it will dry lighter than it looks wet. Again, if you've never or rarely do terrain stuff like this, have your dummy test piece that you've been building all along. Just do it first, let it dry. And if you like the result, then proceed to do the rest of your batch, all your other tiles. So here they are drying, and at this point, I was psyched. This is exactly the amount of color and the, the overall geometric look. This is exactly what I had in my mind's eye. It is so rare for a project to come out exactly as you had envisioned it. Usually, there, you know, there's changes along the way, there's mistakes, but then you end up liking them or adapting them, and the project still comes out great. Well, this is like exactly what I wanted. As I slap down a quick mini dungeon, let me preempt some thoughts and questions. Hey, yeah, they're wallless, but there's a couple ways you can make modular pieces. Walls that clip onto the side, or are somehow rooted underneath the tile. My opinion? Yes, you could do that. And completely undo the entire intent of these tiles. Messing with all those finicky wall bits and their potential combinations needed totally undermines why you would build a tile in this way. Plus, you reintroduce all the grid breaking problems. Hey man, don't use a grid at all, it's antiquated. Yeah, it's a weird one. I actually agree, but I happen to really like the way that the grid looks. So it's an odd case where I actually agree with both sides of the argument at the same time. Hey, that looks pretty realistic. Or, hey, that's not really how cobblestone truly looks. Don't care. Never been concerned with realism in my crafting. 
People like to comment that my potion vendor had a corrugated metal roof, which didn't exist in the Middle Ages. And that's certainly true, but my Dungeons & Dragons games don't take place on Earth. Here's our intrepid party. Let's get a scan at what's before them. How do you keep the tiles from sliding around? Well, what I'm working on here is an upside down 6x4 wargaming mat. So this is the black neoprene side, basically the underside of a mouse pad. Tremendous grip for this example here, but you could use the usual tricks, kitchen liners, magnets, or even a small blob of hot glue at each corner on the underside of the tile. If that's an issue later on, I'll deal with it then. I'm actually gonna take back one of my points earlier. I think in addition to the grid looking good inherently, by having a grid, you hide where a tile meets another. The seam is obscured. It's the same reason I used chunky spaces on my previous tile design, the one and a quarter inch ones, because it obscured where the tile met the other tile and it just looks like one massive bespoke tile. In the near future, as I continue back to basics, I'm gonna be building a set of classic dungeon dressing. I mean, I've made a ton, but a lot of it's from an early part of my career. Doesn't look that great. Doesn't match my newer paint schemes that I tend to use. I do have a massive project, probably beginning later this year, for which these tiles will be very relevant. You're gonna be seeing a lot of them. Well, they look great. They're fun to place at the table and durable solid as a rock no concern for longevity if the whole idea of crafting stuff for your DD &D games is new to you you should know there's a whole world to explore facebook the tabletop crafters guild almost 40,000 members come find us all there like and subscribe if you want to i am wylock thanks for watching make things and play games